In this video I'll be building a voltage multiplier that puts out half a million volts. It may look similar to a Tesla coil, but the output is actually DC. This gives it some unique capabilities, but also makes it a lot more dangerous. You're probably used to seeing capacitors used as buffers to filter out noise, or maybe you've used them for AC coupling. But to understand how such incredible voltages are made possible, let's first look at a lesser known use of a capacitor, which is as a charge pump. Suppose you took a capacitor and charged it up to 12 volts. Then, you disconnected the ground side and applied 12 volts to it. Well now you just have two plates charged to 12 volts, and the capacitor has zero volts across it. Not very exciting. But now suppose we connect a diode to one side and repeat the experiment. Like before, one side is connected to 12 volts and one side is connected to ground. Then, the ground side is disconnected and 12 volts is applied to it. The charges on the other side have nowhere to go because the diode is blocking them, but there's still a 12 volt difference across the capacitor, so if the low side is 12 volts, that means the high side will be raised to 24 volts. We've just created a charge pump that doubles input voltage. No transformer required. Now let's add a two-pole switch to the low side to alternate between 12 volts and ground, and another diode to prevent the output from being pulled back down to 12 volts when the switch connects back to ground. Here's how the output looks across a small load. I'll also add another capacitor in parallel with the load to smooth out the voltage across it, since switching by hand is pretty slow. Here's what the circuit looks like in real life. Let's hook up power and see what the voltage looks like across the load. You may notice that the output isn't exactly double. That's because it has two diode voltage drops in series with the output. Each diode has a drop of around 0.7 volts. Rearranging the circuit a little bit, we can cascade a bunch of these charge pumps in series and get an even bigger output. The output voltage is approximately multiplied by the number of diode capacitor stages in the chain. In the case of my high voltage multiplier, I've got a 9000 volt input and 56 charge pump stages, so the output is a little over 500,000 volts. Okay, let's put it together now. I'm going to arrange all my capacitors and diodes on a 3D printed rack, and the rack will be potted in epoxy which will provide electrical insulation, since it has a dielectric strength around 10 times that of air. Here's the finished rack with all 56 capacitors and diodes. Then I attach some jacks that will allow the transformer to be plugged into the multiplier with banana plugs. The multiplier will need some series resistance to avoid overstretching the diodes, so I'm stringing 50 of these 150 kilo ohm resistors in series for a total of 7.5 mega ohms on the output. Each of these resistors is rated for 10,000 volts and 3 watts. A wire connected to the end of the resistor chain is fed through the top of the multiplier tower and will be in contact with a hex nut which will be used to attach a top load similar to what's on top of a Tesla coil. Okay, so now that the multiplier is done, it needs a high voltage AC supply to feed it, meaning I need to build a transformer. I wound this bobbin with about 500 turns of 32 gauge wire. With 4 turns on the primary and an input voltage of 24 volts, that should give me about 9000 volts peak on my output when I use this CVS driver. Let's fire it up and give it a try. Yeah, not exactly what I was intending. Let's try a design that has more spacing from the transformer core and more partitions for each winding set. Then maybe that arcing won't happen. Okay, here's attempt number two. That looked pretty cool, but the moment I stopped recording, it did the same thing and arced over. Things went on like this for a while, as you can see from my graveyard of transformer bobbins. After doing a little research, I found that most small high voltage transformers have these notches in the fins like this so that when the wire runs from one winding set to another, it crosses up and diagonally so there's almost no contact with windings that would be at a way higher voltage and potentially arc. I also put a little cup around this one, filled it with epoxy, and degassed the epoxy in a vacuum chamber. Let's see if that works any better. Mm -hmm. 
This time things seemed to be running extremely well, although because of my small number of primary windings, I think I was getting in excess of 20,000 volts, which was way more than I needed. I was also running at well over 100 kilohertz, which was causing a tremendous amount of capacitive coupling to the transformer core. You can see this really clearly looking from the top down. The voltage isn't actually passing through the epoxy insulation, but the insulation is acting as a dielectric, causing charges to appear on the inside of the bobbin because of capacitance, and that's the arcing you see. Increasing the number of windings on the transformer primary will reduce the frequency and the voltage, which should mostly make these problems go away. Next, I printed this little tray that the transformer would fit snugly inside of, but also act as a barrier between the core and anything else nearby. I'm going to do a quick test to make sure everything works before I pour epoxy into the multiplier. I'm only giving my ZVS driver 8 volts, so theoretically the transformer should only be outputting 3000 volts, so the multiplier will be at one third of its designed voltage. It seemed to work perfectly fine, but for some reason the discharges were messing with my camera and they'd repeatedly turn it on and off mid-recording and slow down my frame rate. I guess the camera will probably need to be inside of a Faraday cage for this. After testing the multiplier, I poured the epoxy and let it cure. If you're going to try this, I recommend using an epoxy with a long cure time, because mine cured so fast that it got really hot and caused the structure to warp, as you can see from this little bend. Now we'll need some sort of top load to act as a capacitor relative to ground. Without this, I'll just have a whole bunch of low current corona discharge from the output, but with the capacitor, it'll bottle up some voltage and then arc with almost zero impedance, which should make for better sparks. I 3D printed a toroidal top load that's made up of eight segments. This is exactly the same shape you commonly see on top of a Tesla coil. It's also a pretty decent dog collar. Once everything is glued together, I cover it with foil tape and roll a solid metal ball over all that to try and work out some of the creases. Then I screw it on and here's how the tower looks when it's finished. I put my transformer, ZVS drive, and a battery compartment inside of a plastic box. The whole system will run off 24 volts from a 6 cell LiPo battery. The bottom of the box is covered in foil tape to serve as a ground plane because all these charges need to have a really good ground reference or else really bad things can happen within the circuit or to your power supply. The whole circuit is energized by turning on a relay which is controlled by a switch box on several feet of wire so that I don't have to be right next to the tower when it's energized with half a million volts. The coil is meant for 12 volts, but having some LEDs and resistors in series with the relay coil to serve it as status lights, I can safely operate it with 24 volts. Let's turn it on without the tower attached to make sure everything in the box is working. Hot side of the transformer output is alive, so we should be good to go. The lid goes on, and the tower is bolted to it. I also added this magnetic hatch for the battery compartment, which is pretty convenient. Lastly, the transformer leads get connected to the tower and we're ready to turn it on. It seems to output plenty of voltage, but not quite from where I intended. Looks like one of the resistors didn't quite have enough epoxy insulation. Only about a third or maybe half the voltage is going into the top load, and the majority is leaking out the side from that resistor. I guess I'll just go ahead and remove the top load. The voltage still seems to be split between the two points. You can clearly see that the corona discharge is coming out of the hex nut on top, so that's still a pretty big source of leakage. So I sawed down the tower right below the leaky resistor and added an outer shell to provide more epoxy to insulate the resistors since they were probably too close to the walls. Then I added a little cap and a really large diameter insulator for the wire feed through, then reinstalled the top load. Now there were two more resistors that were leaking. I guess I should have just made the extra insulation cover all of them. The top load discharges were still really weak from all the leakage. This was improved slightly with a spherical electrode, which causes less charge leakage because it didn't have any pointy edge, but overall the top load output was still pretty bad. Here's the aftermath of the arcing out of the side. So I went ahead and just sawed off the whole resistor section of the tower, which left me with only the multiplier itself. 
This wouldn't have any current limiting on the output, which was likely to damage the high voltage diodes, but I wanted to see what this device could do without all the leakage. Not surprisingly, removing the resistor chain gave the best results. The arcs were anywhere from 6 to 8 inches long and extremely bright. In fact, I probably should have been wearing welding goggles for this because my eyes hurt a little bit afterward. You definitely want to be careful if you try to make one of these. The obvious hazard is the electric shock, but there's also a little bit of arc flash hazard from the extremely bright sparks. In addition to that, hard x-rays are generated above about 150,000 volts and we're at 500,000. Now, the amount of radiation is incredibly small unless the discharge is occurring in a really high vacuum, but there's still a small amount of radiation hazard. Finally. When air is ionized and then recombined, it doesn't always get put back together the same way. Nitric oxide, dinitrogen tetroxide, and ozone are all produced as a result of the recombination after an electrical discharge, and these can pose a respiratory hazard in an unventilated area. The only hazard category I didn't manage to achieve was to also make the device a tripping hazard, but I'm working on that for the second version. As much as I love big arcs, I really wanted to do this project for high-powered electrostatic experiments, but I got sidetracked by fixing all the bugs with the device. At voltages approaching 1 million, electrostatic forces can be produced similar to those from weak magnets. In fact, just turning this thing on caused my hair and my clothes to be pulled toward it slightly, and that was from a few feet away. I'll probably try to build another one of these and insulate it much better and use a top load that minimizes charge leakage, like a super smooth large diameter sphere. In addition, I'll need better grounding to get the best results. Some copper rods driven deep into the dirt will probably be necessary. Anyway, I hope you found this video interesting. If you attempt to build one of these yourself, just be extremely careful because the DC discharges are way more dangerous than the high frequency AC from a Tesla coil. Thanks for watching.